Great to have you there. What are we up to today? Get ready for the deep dive on this particular machine. Now this machine is fantastic. We have specifications like 44 cores and 88 threads. There's also seven PCI slots. I mean, you could load this up with all sorts of hardware. We're gonna take it completely apart. Give or take, and check out all that makes this machine such a great deal. We're gonna look at this in a lot of detail. Starting with the uh, very nice aesthetics. And stay tuned, there's gonna be a future video where we're gonna look at all the other generations as well. But for now, let's zone in just on the Z840. Definitely subscribe if you want to see the others. We'll do the HP Z800, the HP Z820, which actually I've already done a video on, so check out a related video. And obviously the present is the HP Z840 from MacGyver Wear Workstation, this is it. And we'll also do the Bruce Wayne Supercomputer, the HP Z8. Stay tuned for that one. But for now, is this the ideal powerhouse? Talking about powerhouse, if you already have one of these, share your specs. Take note, these have the X99 Haswell or Broadwell designation Xeons. We have DDR4 ECC registered, up to 2400 megahertz. These are ideal for things like CAD workhorse, maybe a budget gaming rig, video editing, coding, or even a NAS or file server. They were first released in 2014, so maybe a little bit aged now. Check out the CPU fan module. We've got four RAM fans and two CPU fans built into that module. And this particular machine here has the uprated 3D vapor coolers from HP. They nested about a five degree drop in my testing. Really, really good deal for these Eons. Now this particular system here is fitted with the E52697 V3s, which are really, really good. But talking about CPUs, which ones are the best? Tell you what, let's load up my lab zero and have a quick look. Surely we can figure out which ones are the best. And indeed, I've loaded up an entire database. Let's scan through. Which one do you need? Now for this particular data table, I've taken what I believe are the best CPUs for the Z840 and populated them. We have Passmark Benchmark Score. We have the Core Count. We even have the Clock Rate. That's the base clock rate for each CPU as well as the Turbo Clock Rate for each one. We also have the OWL3 Cache. How much memory is on that thing? We also have the total power that this particular CPU may pull. Very, very useful when you're planning your build. We also have things like the bus speed and even the total amount of memory and the memory bandwidth. And take note, these particular ones for the Broadwell, 1600 up to 2400 megahertz. I even included the temperature range so we know what sort of range the CPU end up choosing can sustain. Oh, that 98 is up to 90 degrees, that's pretty impressive. And there's even an eBay price for those who are interested, check that out. But let's do a deep dive on these. Sure, also check out the V3s, the Broadwell generation, while we're here. Again, not a complete table, but we have most of the V3s that I would recommend. There's our pass mark ranking. Definitely compare those. You'll notice some of the uh, scores are quite variable there, which is quite cool. And uh, up to 18 cores on this generation. Pretty decent CPU clock rate as well. Definitely check out the turbo rates. Some of these CPUs are actually quite fast, even in the modern day. They get the job done, not too bad. Slight drop in L3 cache compared to the newer Broadwell generation. Decent power draw on each of those as well. Take note of the bus speed, they're all identical, which is kind of handy. And the max memory is down about half of what the Broadwells can hold. So a decent uh, bandwidth there. Also have a slight drop on the speed, 21 to 33 megahertz fastest. And there's the temperature ranges as well. That may be of use to you if you're trying to get your machine running optimally. And there's also the eBay price in US dollars as of present day. But now, which ones? I'm currently using the E52697, really good option, but which one do you need? Which of these are the best? Well, I looked at all of these and, well, there's the uh, 2697A V4, so that one's quite handy. But I actually created four categories. I've gone for the Gaming King. Now, what's the Gaming King for the V4 gen? I've gone with the 2696 because it's so well-rounded, they're actually relatively affordable. It's basically the equivalent of the 2699 CPU. So really good, 22 cores, and actually a really, really good performing CPU overall. So I'm gonna call it the Core Dominator because it's actually well-priced. Now the all-rounder has to be the 2697 or maybe the 2697A, a couple of core difference between them. They are really good in terms of their boost clock speed, so ideal maybe for video games. 
if you were going that direction on your system. Now, another CPU to keep an eye out for is the E52687W, which is a very powerful CPU as well. Decent clock speed, but that one does use quite a bit of power, so stay, stay cautious of that one. Might use too much power for your liking. Now, the next one there, the gaming king for the V3 gen has to be the 97, the 2697, because it has such a good clock speed and overall very high base clock speed. Now, I'm going to say core dominated, 2696, all rounder. Probably again the 2697 and the super heavy, while well, surprise surprise is again the 2687W with its 160 watt power draw. And take note, all of this data was compiled and verified using Intel's database. Let's continue our dive. This is the PSU for this system. It's a proprietary unit, 1450 watt max on 240 volt mains. We do have these little plugs at the back that are really, really instrumental and getting our power supply connected up to the system. It's also a little green indicator. And we have our standard IEC 6320 C13 plug and C14 socket. Here's the specifications. The question you will have is, what exactly can you run on these? Well, these particular machines, at least with the powerful power supply, there are two versions. The powerful one comes with three six-pin power cables. Each one of those is rated to 218 give or take watt. That is a tremendous amount of power. I even powered something like the RTX 3090 Ti on my system. This particular one has the RTX 3080, which is a really powerful GPU as well. But you can absolutely load these up with your ideal modern GPU. Now, in terms of storage, we've got four 3.5 inch hot swap bays with vibration grommets. They do sus and sata, that's a key point. Now, take note of these Z coolers. They did net a five degree Celsius drop. Sorry for those operating Fahrenheit. And DDR4 memory. This particular one is loaded with 2133 megahertz, a total of 256 gigabyte. Now, in terms of PSU, very important to note, there is actually a lower power PSU option as well, the 850 watt. If you have got that one, I believe you only have two six pin connectors. So that could be a downside. This particular one has two 5.25 inch bays, one mole X and two SATA power connections. At the moment, we've got a Quadro P2000, the kind of GPU you would likely see in this machine. And take note, we do have both a SATA and a SUS chipset, allowing you to run both of those interfaces. But very important, the max power on those six pins, 219, 218-ish watt. So be cautious of that one as well. But that's a lot of power, much more than your standard 8-pin ATX power. Now, very important on refitment, make sure you look for flush fitment. And here is our memory modules. This particular one is loaded with lots of fans. Check out the specifications for each of these. I've tried my best to match them up with the exact items, which means you can find the parts if you need to. But thus far, I've never had one of these fans fail, so I guess that's a good sign. One little detail, this plug can be a little problematic. If it makes poor contact, your fans may run at max speed or may not run at all, and you'll get problems booting into your system. So that's quite a common little thing, but it's very easy. We've got our two green handles. We simply slot that into place. The little power connector is in the top right corner. Once it connects up, make sure you give it a good nudge, and usually it runs without any problems. Let's check out these hard drive bays. Really, really easy to remove. Uh, this particular one here is a nice Western Digital Red NUS drive, which I use for storing lots of these videos. Really, really cool. But very easy to fit. We've got a fully toolless design with those vibration grommets, and definitely stay tuned for a future video where we do uh, this whole process for the HP ZAG4, that's going to be exciting. But in the meantime, tell you what, let's remove all of these bays. I'm sure you want to see what's cooking inside one of these bays in terms of how they're connecting these. Because remember, these are compatible with both SUS and SATA in the same connector. That's such a cool feature. So let's do a deep dive here. The joys of lighting, it's never quite bright enough. We can see what's cooking at the back. We have a very special connector there. Check out the part number that allows us to run both of those interfaces. But we're going to go even further. We're going to go further than anyone's ever gone. Potentially, we're going to deep dive into the full inner workings. Let's grab my handy screwdriver here. I actually need to buy this for digging into the HP Z8 G4. Stay tuned for a future video. But let's get this front panel off. Two screws holding that side in place. We can quickly slot these caddies back in. In fact, I'm going to do it one-handed because it's just that easy to slot these in. There it is. Wow, that's as quick as anyone's ever done it. Okay, good. Let's rotate this round. Now, in order to get the face panel off, the front face, we actually have to remove the side panel as well. This is the rear panel. 
and uh, check out the peel's still there but we won't peel it for now we'll leave it for the next owner that's right i'm going to sell this machine eventually but uh, let's see if we can figure out where these screws are so we've got four little screws that we need to undo in order to get these face blades off although technically you may not have to remove all four but i'll just give you a quick demo if you did have to replace your feet on this particular machine pretty easy to do as well but now if these uh clips loosened we can simply slide this rear panel out it's actually quite tricky i made it look really easy there but it does take a bit of force but take note it just slides in and out now we can remove these massive screws or bolts that keep the handles in place that also keeps the front face uh, attached to the case now with these a little tricky to get out you may have to move your front fascia just a little bit but then the handles pop out and all the screws are removed we can now remove the front face plate as simple as that. Very well designed. I feel like there's some cool things here. Here's the front I.O. which can be removed with only one screw. That is quite a common failure point here. I've had, I think all machines that I've had have had trouble with the top USB port. Uh, it may just be a coincidence or maybe that's one that gets the most use in daily routines. Now there's our SATA and SUS connector. You can also see where the, the side panel will normally slot in. And there's our front faceplate. Very well designed. We've got a little bit of aluminium there. Take note, we do have two of these 5.25 inch bays. There is space for a third. I don't know why they deleted it. That would have been really handy, but nonetheless, we have two. I do love the nice matte black finish that they've done here. It's a nice aesthetic touch. So you don't see the silver panels through the front fascia. Now, in terms of refitment, it's actually really simple as well. We have to put the handle back in first. Pretty straightforward. It's actually quite sturdy once you put the bolt through, which is cool. And then we can fit our faceplate. We do need to proc the machine up ever so slightly for that to clear underneath. But once we're through there, it's actually a really easy refitment. Refit those four screws and that's reassembled. Why did I disassemble it? Just so you could see what's cooking underneath and how you need to do it if you ever needed to do it. Now take note, these hooks are really important. We need to set them into our machine and then slide this forward in order to get that to clip into place. Give it a good nudge, it takes a bit of force. Then we can reattach the two screws, which will secure that particular side panel. Then we can refit our rods, keeping those handlebars in place. And our machine is now very nearly fully reassembled. And uh, take note of these handles as well. I've never had one break, which I think is really impressive. They're really sturdy in construction. Uh, absolute props to HP for the design on these. Now put the rod through and make sure that we get a good fit before we retention in this case i'm actually using the torque wrench probably not good for it probably better to use just a normal uh, screwdriver but in this case it's okay and there it is top faceplate reassembled we'll have one last little peek through this upper bay definitely recommend these e coolers they are absolutely incredible in terms of reducing temperature not as big a gain as i would have hoped but a solid five degree reduction in temperature which i think is really good value Let's go for a quick guide on PCIe slots. Where are we meant to install our PCIe adapters? Which slot is most appropriate for your particular needs? Well, let's do a quick check. Starting with PCIe slot 1, which is connected to CPU 0. It's a PCIe 3.0 X4 mechanical with four electrical lanes. It's ideally suited to network cards, USB cards, maybe a NVMe boot drive, or even a Wi-Fi adapter. Slot 2. This one's also connected to CPU 0. It's a X6 mechanical slot with 16 electrical lanes and check out the size differential there we can fit up to a 330 millimeter gpu or if you remove your hard drive fans you can actually fit something like the rtx 3090 ti the zotac ampolo extreme but that is literally the largest gpu you can fit in this machine it only just fit next one slot three this one's connected to cpu one it's a pcie 3.0 x8 mechanical with eight electrical lanes it's also open ended so you could fit a longer card but this is usually obscured by your gpu although i found a little bypassing maneuver we can actually use riser cables to dodge that problem next one slot four which is a pcie 3.0 x16 mechanical with 16 electrical lanes it's also usually obscured but this one's good maybe for a second gpu or even for bifurcation if you were that way inclined something like the aorus gen 4 nvme adapters is well suited 
Now slot five, connected to CPU one, it's also a PCIe 3.0 X8 mechanical with eight electrical lanes. Now this slot is also open-ended, usually obscured by the GPU, but you should be able to add quite a lot of different add-in cards, something like an NVMe adapter, or maybe a host bus adapter, or even a 10 gigabit network interface card. Lots of options there. Next one, PCIe slot six, connected to CPU zero. It is a PCIe 3.0 X16 with 16 electrical lanes and this one's ideally suited to a second GPU, something like the RTX A4000. Really, really good candidate. But you could also install something like this, the HP Z Turbo Drive Quad Pro, which would allow four NVMEs to be installed on a single PCI slot through bifurcation, little setting of the BIOS. But check a related video on that one, and especially for bifurcation as well. Now, next one, PCIe slot 7. This one's connected to CPU zero. It's a little bit underwhelming. It's only a PCIe 2.0, one mechanical slot with one electrical lane. So ideally suited to USBs or maybe an old serial device. And now I'd say you are well educated on your Z840's PCIe connectivity. But take note, we do need two CPUs to make use of CPU one's PCIe slots. That's a little technicality. And there's our base machine. Absolutely a work of art. Now, what do we do next? There's one thing that remains, the most logical thing as well. What exactly can you use this machine for? Well, there's several use, end use cases, CAD workhorse, video editing. You could definitely do gaming or maybe a NAS or a server, but this is my ideal list. I would go for 128 gig of maybe DDR4 2400 megahertz. I would add in dual E5 2697V4 CPUs. Definitely a pair of the Z coolers if you can find them. Maybe some tough armor adapters for the 5.25 inch bay so we can get lots of NVMEs loaded up to our system. You could add a whole bunch of NVMEs in your PCIe slots. I would definitely add the 540 dual 10 gigabit NIC. You could even expand that further if you wanted more rapid transfer or networking. Could definitely recommend some of these SATA connectors as well, especially if you're gonna populate your 5.25 inch bays with lots of SSDs or NVMEs. That's right, you can do NVMEs in those, check a related video. Now, one last little detail, this CPU fan module can be a little tricky. On this particular Z840, I have had problems where it doesn't always make good contact. And when it doesn't make good contact, the fans start racing. So very simple thing, just make sure this little connector here makes excellent contact. Could be worth checking, you'll notice the seating on it can move a little bit as well. So I suspect sometimes they get damaged from uh, normal wear and tear. So just make sure you get a nice solid connection. Give it a good nudge in that top right corner. Give you a quick demo there, one-handed. It's actually quite awkward being able to do this over the camera. The camera's right in front of me. It's really awkward. But there it is. It's reinserted. Right now it actually will give an error code because I didn't push the top corner. So keep that in mind. Now this lower chamber shroud is quite a well-engineered piece, but to be honest, I've not been able to run it on any of my systems because it doesn't clear the GPU. These little fins get in the way. Not even something like a GTX 970 works. So kind of important. You do need to be able to slot this in. If you're running Quadro cards, it does help retain good airflow in that lower bay. Very important for PCI slot function. And there it is. Let's give it a spin. Give it a thumbs up and I'm going to say, well done, you made it through. One last little thing. The side panel. Now check it out, this particular latch is absolutely over-engineered, a work of art to say the least. We do have lots of handy instructions on the side panel as well, from the system error codes, system part designations, motherboard allocations, and even the RAM loading order, which is kind of handy as well. And that ends our Z840 overview. Now one key detail for a future video, we're also going to go through a few other parts. Shall I give you a quick demo? Do you want to see what we're covering next time? Uh, I will actually mention, you probably noticed this already, but right now I'm actually using a new microphone. You can actually see it here as well. Check that out. How cool is that? We got a new microphone for the system. It's sounding so much better by my ears. Hopefully you have the same experience, but really loving that new microphone. It's a Audio Technica. I can highly recommend it. Really, really good. Now, what else can we look forward to? Well, if you're following my posts and maybe on the Reddit page as well, you would have picked up this little guy. This is a Lenovo Think Center M920Q. It is a mini PC and it's about a one liter volume. So it really is a, a really tiny little machine, but they are incredibly powerful because we can run and you'll see the little aerial there as well uh, for Wi-Fi. But 
You could do so much of these little machines. Pretty much anything you could dream up, you will be able to run on these little machines. What am I going to do with this one? Give me half a second. My objective is really simple. I'm going to see if I can install 10 gigabit networking on this little mini PC using a rather controversial looking adapter. This is going to adapt to our M.2 slot. You can ignore the NVMe adapter. That was me testing an HP Z840. That's why it's relevant. And this particular one, I think, is the power adapter for this particular slot. Now, that's going to potentially allow for 10 gigabit networking on our mini PC. Stay tuned for a future video where we cover that and see if it even works. So far, I'm not convinced, but I got my fingers crossed. Now, what else can we look forward to? Well, here's a slight a side project. Have I got that the right way around? Yes, I do. Amazing. This is the HP Z440's memory shroud. Now, if you're familiar with that system, you may know in order to run eight memory modules, we do need to be able to run this particular guy. Why? Because there's a little power connector here, six pin, very strange looking connector, almost looks like a GPU six pin, but a mini version. And without this, you run into some trouble. Now, there are some videos out there that show how to bypass this issue. But I'm hoping to find a slightly better fix. And better yet, can we fit this? Particularly if you've done an HPZ 440 case swap, which I have, it's sitting right next to me here, but is it possible? Can we slot this in and maybe somehow get this on a case swap to allow us to run f maybe eight modules without any problems? Why would you run, a, run eight RAM modules on a Z440? Well, it's ideal if it's a server, right? That's exactly what I'm using mine for. So stay tuned, future videos, we'll go through that and so much more. I don't think I've missed anything, that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy. Race is E out. See you on the next one.